You're about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Bob Burns, Jimmy Durante, Billy Eckstein... Celeste Holm, Evelyn Knight... Shick Pearl... Cliff Hall... Smith Ann... Dale... Meredith Wilson... And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Lula Bankhead. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. So listen, America, the curtains of America, we're going to fill your father full of stars. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at this same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, putting together this week's big show has been the most ghastly experience. (laughs) It all started when I very helpfully suggested that they were engaging too many singers for our program. NBC could save a lot of money, especially since they have me on the show to sing. (laughs) But it seems when they come to choosing the talent on this show, I have no voice. I didn't mean that to sound exactly like that. Now, what I mean is, after all, I I was on another show this past week as a singer, and I was good, too. I got 639 telephone votes. I ran second only to one very talented young man who played Home Sweet Home on his head with a mallet. (laughs) But that doesn't mean a thing to NBC. They go out and hire this this, uh, Billy Eckstein. I can sing better than she can. I don't care who she is. (laughs) You can, Tallulah? Oh, are you Billy Eckstein? I don't know what makes you think I'm taking away your singing job. After all, I'm a baritone. The world, darling. <laughs> you see, you're a bass. <laughs> well, Billy, I really didn't have you in mind when I was talking about the singers they have for this show. I was thinking more about the girl singers, like this, uh, this uh, Doris Day they, uh, they come up with. It's not Doris Day. It's Evelyn Knight. Well, day or night, you are the one, Evelyn. <laughs> and not only do they hire you and Billy Eckstein, but they give me another singer, Jimmy Durante. <laughs> How do you like that note, Tillou? A note like that will get you nothing, Jimmy. With that note, I can get $250,000 from the RFC. (laughs) Ah, mink coat. (laughs) Naturally, I'll return the mink coat. It takes me long enough to shave as it is. Well, Jimmy, darling, I'm not worried about your singing on this program because your singing is mostly comedy. Now, I would sing uh, love songs. I can sing love songs, too. Oh, you can? I never heard you. Oh, sure. Get a load of this. You don't need penicillin. You don't need auromycium. You just need sulfamilonite. <laughs> you're not in love. You're just sick. <laughs> Why, Jimmy, that's wonderful. I never heard you sing so beautifully. And next week, to you, at the St. Patrick's Day Parade, I'm going to sing... Tallulah-loo, Tallulah, Tallulah-loo, Ta-ai, Tallulah-loo, Tallulah, you're an Irish alibi. You 
you see what I mean, though, Jimmy, darling? Everybody who comes on this program is allowed to sing. But when I want to sing, you should hear the inhuman cry that goes up. Before you sing? <laughs> yes, they don't even give me a chance. Well, don't you have a sponsor on this program? Why don't you go to your sponsor and complain? Oh, we have three sponsors. We have, now let me see, we have RCA Victor. No, I don't think your singing would help their business. Well, and we have Chesterfield Cigarettes. No, your voice wouldn't help their business either. And we have Anison Headache Tablets. That's the one to go to. <laughs> oh, Jimmy, Jimmy. I'm disappointed in you. I thought you'd help me out in this little problem I'm having here. After all, Jimmy, I don't sing as bad as all that. There are many facets to my voice. Speaking of facets, have you ever practiced singing in the bathtub? Do you? Every time I take a breath, I practice my singing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming to something, something tough. <laughs> Every time I take a bath, I practice my singing. Eight gents, the froom and cleanser. <laughs> I told you you should have played it, Meredith. <laughs> well, I got over it. <laughs> Please, that takes, Jimmy. That takes the ring out of the bathtub and puts it in my voice. <laughs> now, Jimmy, no plugs. How can I take a bath without a plug? Well, I have a confession to make, Jimmy. I always practice singing when I'm in the tub. But only this afternoon when I was taking a bath, I was singing, I'll be singing. In the bathtub? <laughs> oh. Please. Now I know what's wrong with your voice. You should spray it with rinse -o. You've got a dishpan throat. <laughs> well, it looks like everybody's at my throat. I know there can't be that much difference between my singing and everybody else's. Oh, Jimmy, I'm going to let one of our guests sing now. She's one of our very best singers. I want you to listen to her and see if you can tell why everybody would rather hear her than me. It's Evelyn Knight singing her great recording, I Remember the Cornfields.
by the golden cornfields of home. Thank you, Evelyn, darling. You were simply fair. Simply fair? Oh, you don't like that, Evelyn? Well, would you prefer me to say you were uh, fairly simple? I know what's bothering you, Tallulah. You're just jealous of my singing. I? Jealous of your singing? <laughs> really, my dear girl. Oh, I suppose there is an audience that likes good singing, but... Uh, there must be an audience for me, too. Uh, I was just talking to Jimmy Durandy about it a moment ago. Jimmy, where are you? Right here, Tillou. I've been listening to Evelyn sing like you told me, and I've come to a ghastly conclusion. <laughs> Tillou, you should have your tonsils out. But I've already had my tonsils out. Then put them back in. <laughs> At least one. Tallulah, I don't know why you keep worrying about singing. After all, you're a, a dramatic actress. You know the old saying, shoemaker, stick to your last. You mean I should stick to acting? Either that or learn to make shoes. And I know where I'd like to put my first shoe. Tallulah, there's no use getting angry about it. If you want to sing, you've got to work at it. I love to sing. I take care of my voice. I never go to bed later than nine o'clock, practice scales all day. Before going to bed, I drink warm milk, never have dates more than twice a month, and I'm always home before nine o'clock. And that's how I keep in condition, so I can sing. Yeah? What have you got to sing about? <laughs> well, if you want to sing, Tallulah, you've got to stick to a schedule like that. Warm milk every night? I would rather die. Well, it's either you or your audience. Now, just a minute. This isn't fair. You two picking on Tallulah. Oh, thank you, Billy Eckstein. You've heard me sing, haven't you? Well, uh, no, I haven't, really. Would you care to run over one of your songs for me? Oh, I'd be glad to, Billy. Give my regards to Broadway. Remember me to Harrow Square. Tallulah, I said run over it, not trample it to death. <laughs> Oh, I see. You've joined the opposition, too. Oh, no. I want to help you. Now, let me show you how to sing that. Listen to this. La, 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 Oh, that's very pretty, Billy. Uh, what's the name of that song? <laughs> Let's give my regards to Broadway. Really? Well, what do you know? Two different songs with the same title. <laughs> well, sing something else for us, will you, Billy? Okay, I'll sing If. Go right ahead, Billy. I hope he knows the words to this better than he knows Give My Regards to Broadway. Yeah. 
crowd I turn in my knees to you If I rule the earth What would life be worth If I that one, and you sang it divinely. Well, I'm glad we finished with the singing department on this program. But wait a minute, Tallulah. You've got Celeste Holm on the show. She's a singer. Oh, no. I took care of that. <laughs> Celeste is an actress. She won an Academy Award in motion pictures. She's in a play without music now on Broadway, Affairs of State. Yes, but she became a star in Oklahoma. She sang in that one. Well, I've already fixed it so she won't sing on this program. <laughs> when I found out that she was going to be on the show, last Monday it was, I telephoned her. Well, I certainly straightened her out about what she was going to do on the show. And I made sure she was not going to sing. Hello? Uh, hello. Is this the residence of Celeste Holm? Yes, sir. <laughs> Oh, is that you, Celeste? Um, who is this? Oh, this is Tallulah. Oh, uh, uh one moment, uh, s'il vous plaît. I, I will see if madame is here. Thank you, Rochester. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good heavens, what is she calling me about now? She's already called me about what to wear on the show, and I promised I'd try not to look young. What can she want now? <laughs> Hello? Uh, this is Miss Holmes' secretary. May I help you? Well, I want to speak to Miss Holmes personally, if I could, please. Well, I'm so sorry, but there are no passes for her play on Broadway. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's not about that, really. It's about the big show on Sunday. Oh, well, she can get you plenty of tickets for that. <laughs> Who is this, please? Look, miss. <laughs> this is Tallulah Bankhead. Who? A Tallulah Bankhead. Uh, <laughs> What's so funny about that? Well, nothing. It sounds as if you're saying Tallulah Bankhead. I am saying Tallulah Bankhead. Oh, I beg your pardon. How do you spell that? <laughs> well, I'm not very good at spelling, but let me see now. Try. Well, now we see. Let's see. A T A L. What's that first letter? A T. 
T as in taboo. As in what? Taboo. Lunkhead. Oh, Taboola Lunkhead. <laughs> My dear girl. I am going to inform Miss Holmes that you are without doubt the most inefficient, incompetent secretary anybody ever had. And if Miss Holmes doesn't fire you the minute I tell her... Oh, please, please, please don't. Please don't tell her. I try to do my best. It's just that she treats me so badly. She overworks me from morning to night, washing and ironing. Washing and ironing? Washing and ironing her hair. (laughs) Oh, you mean that beautiful head of hair is not real? Oh, no, please, please don't say I told you. I don't want to lose my job. I'm so... Oh, no, of course I won't. Thank you, my darling. I won't say a word. Oh, so the hair's not really hers. <laughs> well, of course, I suspected it all the time. But... Oh, oh, it is hers. I paid for it. That's another thing. She makes me do all her shopping, and she keeps me busy on the phone from morning till night, calling up an escort service for men to take her out. Calling an escort service? The one on Madison Avenue all day long. The I... one on Madison? Oh, no, darling, that's not the good one, darling. The one I... <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, well, my dear, uh, you really, uh, you shouldn't talk this way about Miss Home. After all, she is your employer. What about her figure, my dear? Uh, She has a perfect figure. You uh, can't say anything about her figure. Or can you? Oh, well, it is a perfect figure. I hand it to her every morning. (laughs) No. Oh, my dear, I must have lunch with you some evening. I want you to meet some of my friends. Walter Winchell, Earl Wilson, and at Lyons. I simply can't understand why you stay on in this home if she treats you so shabbily. Well, please don't tell her, but you see, I want to be an actress. And I took this job so I can stay close to Miss Home and learn how to be the great actress she is. And you know she is getting on in years. And I'm just waiting for my chance to take her place in the theatre. That plot sounds familiar to me. <laughs> But it would make a good picture all about Celeste. <laughs> oh, 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 you won't tell her I've told you, will you? She'd whip me. Whip you? Oh, yes, yeah, she's a regular Simon Legree. Oh, Miss Holm just came in. I'll put her on. Hello, Tallulah. Hello, Simon, darling. <laughs> what? I mean Eve. I mean Celeste. Uh, darling, I called you about the big show. Now, it won't be necessary for you to sing on it. We have plenty of singers, including myself. Oh, but Tallulah, I have a wonderful new number to sing. That's where I've been. I've been rehearsing it all afternoon with an orchestra, and I just want you to hear it. It's a song called The Happy Ending from a 20th Century Fox picture on the Riviera. And my friend Sylvia Fine wrote it, and she told me I should be sure to sing it on your show. So listen to it, Tallulah. Okay, fellas, you can play it now. Your orchestra came home with you? (laughs) They escorted me home. I have a wonderful escort service. I'll give you the number if you want it. I know the number, 802. To be sheep for the end to be bleed. The fad to be sad has been had. Or do you like your drama? Oh, so stark that when the lights go on, where are you? Still in the dark, misery may be some people's cup of tea. But brother. Makes me feel so good when I see a happy ending. Give me a happy ending every time. It makes me feel so bad when the curtain is descending and lovers aren't blending. That's a crime. Don't want the hero to be the one who done it. Don't want my heroine left all alone to gun it. If that is corny, don't ever let them stop corn. I want to relax and eat my popcorn. So make me feel real good when I see that final fade out. I want that mortgage paid out every dime. 
want to yip it, want to yak it, leave my hanky in my pocket and see a happy ending every time. In a western, the time I really love it is when the doctor yells hot water and plenty of it. When the villain's bullet rips the hero's hat away. Look out! They went that away. So bring the girls on stage, let them take that final entrance, and make that final entrance look sublime. Let them smile or sing a ditty, or just stand there and look pretty. Let them really reek with glamour as we wind up this here dream. While we dance it, while we shout it, while we leave no doubt about it, we like a happy ending every time. Yes, it, yes, everybody rock it. Happy ending every time. Hello, Tallulah, you still there? Uh, well, Celeste, I-, I see you have an escort service for applause, too. Well, didn't you like the song, Tallulah? Uh, darling, it's not a question of how much I like it. It's a question of how much I hate it. You mean you won't let me sing it on your show? Now, let's put it bluntly, darling. If you sing the song on the show, you'll be a big hit. So you're not going to sing it. <laughs> Well, I've got news for you, Tallulah. My contract reads that I can sing on your program if I want to. And I want to. Well, I've got news for you, honey. I just had a most informative chat with your combination secretary, maid, and figure hander. Tallulah, are you threatening me? If the figure fits, darling, wear it. Tallulah. Yes? I telephoned you last Sunday evening about six o'clock and you weren't home. Well, of course not, darling. I'm on this show at six o'clock. Yes, I know. I had an hour and a half chat with your combination maid, masseurs, and girdle stretcher. (laughs) Oh, Celeste, darling, uh, why don't you sing your first song in the first half hour? (laughs) And then, of course, if you want to sing several other songs, you can sing whenever you feel like it. I, well, I wouldn't do more for Catherine Hepburn. Oh, and speaking of Catherine Hepburn, I was talking to her maid the other day. Yes, and what did she say? Well, darling, you wouldn't believe it, but she told me. If you feel like singing, sing, but all your cares away. There's something about giving up in the song Makes you belong, helps you find a peace of mindfulness If you feel like humming hum, fiddle-dee-dee-da-dee-dum Supposing you do re be slightly off-key, everyone can be a bee Tell your friends to go face to face, start making face If you feel like singing, sing You have been listening to Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. And now I'd like to take just a moment before we continue to say that this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is the National Broadcasting Company Sunday Extravaganza with the most scintillating personalities in show business. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, is brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. By Chesterfield, the cigarette that has for you what every smoker wants, mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. The cigarette that brings you Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. And by the makers of Anacin, for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. The big stars in this program are Bob Burns, Jimmy Durante, Billy Eckstein, Cliff Hall, Celeste Holm, Evelyn Knight, Jack Pearl, Smith and Dale, Meredith Wilson and his big show orchestra and chorus, and every week, 
Your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> Well, darling, we think we have a treat for you on the big show this week. In the world of entertainment, there are certain classics which are ageless. Now, stop snickering. I'm not talking about myself. (laughs) We have collected this week several classic comedy performers who have contributed priceless gems of entertainment which will long be remembered in our business. Those of you who have heard these artists will laugh again. But it will be a new and refreshing experience to the younger generation, of which I happen to be a member. Hello, little girl. Well, the first of these is the Arkansas traveler himself, Bob Burns. (laughs) Bob, I can't tell you how delightfully surprised and gratified I was to hear you were coming back to radio to be on our show, especially after they explained to me who you were. Now, how did you happen to decide to come east, darling? Well, I'll tell you, Miss Bankhead. May I withdraw the question? No. No, I want to tell you because I got a proposition for you. Uh, You do? Yeah, you see, I thought about opening a nightclub here and taking you in as a partner. Now, I understand you got a lot of money and you got a big name to draw the people in, and I was thinking about cutting you in as a partner 50-50. I put up the money and the name. What are you putting up? Well, after we get the people in, somebody's got to entertain them. Why can't I entertain? Well, to tell you the truth, I believe you could. I've been listening to all this talk about you not being able to sing, and, you know, I don't believe your singing's ever had the proper musical background. You know, I believe my bazooka is the only instrument in the world that will blend with your voice. You mean you're going to let me sing while you play? Oh, Bob, you're very kind. I don't think so, and I'll tell you why. You know, Miss Bankhead, you kind of remind me of my Aunt Boo. (laughs) I'd like to tell you, you better sit down over there. Now, this may take some time. (laughs) You know, one of the reasons why I was so anxious to get on this show here is because I wanted to see if I'd feel the same way when Miss Bankhead called me Darling as one of my uncles did years ago down in Van Buren. One of them city girls come to Van Buren and she said darling to everybody, didn't think anything about it. She called my uncle darling and he took it to heart. He got to thinking about it, he liked it. And he fell in love with her. And it got so bad he finally went up to her and told her if she didn't marry him, he'd die. Of course, she didn't think anything of it. She turned him down and sure enough, Sixty-five years later, he died. (laughs) Now, you know, my grandpa, Stazzy, just swears that that Miss Bankhead and my Aunt Boo are kin because they not only both come from Alabama, but, well, my Aunt Boo's first name is Tallulah. Of course, I always call her Aunt Boo by her nickname. I never call her Aunt Tallulah because... I understood if you use the word Tallulah, you're liable to get sued. (laughs) So I want you people, now if you will, I want you to follow me through this thing. I want to describe Aunt Boo and see if you can't see the similarity in them two women. Now first, uh, Aunt Boo was kind of the dominating type. I remember the, the morning I was at her house when she took the skillet test. Now, we had, the boys down home won't marry a girl unless they can stand that skillet test. A girl has to throw a skillet up the chimney and run out in the yard and catch it in her apron before it hits the ground. <laughs> well, now, when, when Aunt Boo threw this skillet up the chimney, she threw it way up in the air, and there was a high wind blowing that day, and it carried this skillet quite a ways, and Aunt Boo had to jump four barbed wire fences, but she got it. <laughs> I remember when, when Papa saw her catch it, he nudged Uncle Uni. He says, Uni, I think you got something there. <laughs> and he did, too. Do you know at the wedding, when, when Uncle Uni said, I do, that's the last decision the man ever made? <laughs> you know, I don't want you to think now that they didn't get along because they did. 
because when they was first married, Aunt Boo made a rule that if one of them started an argument, the other one would walk out of the house. They've not only had 40 years of happy married life, but today Uncle Uni is the healthiest man you ever saw <laughs> from spending so much of his life outdoors. <laughs> are, you, are you beginning to, to get the similar, similarity there between the two women? It's beginning to show up. I remember when I was a little boy, uh, Aunt Boo was in the kitchen by herself and the window was open. Uncle Uni was plowing out in the field. And I saw a great, big, huge wildcat jump through the window right in this room where Aunt Boo was. Well, I was scared to death. I went out and I told Uncle Uni about it, and he just kept on plowing. I says, Uncle, Uncle Uni, ain't you going back there? He says, listen, Robin, that wildcat got in there of his own accord. Let him get out the best way. <laughs> Why, do you know, one time, I'll never forget if I live a thousand years, the years the crows got so bad, they were just eating up Uncle Uni's corn, and Uncle Uni put out a scarecrow in the middle of the cornfield, but them crows were so brazen, they just didn't pay any attention to the scarecrow, they went right on eating it. And Aunt Boo went out there and stood in the cornfield herself. You know, them crows got so scared they brought back corn they stole four years of it. <laughs> There's another similarity there between the two women. Aunt Boo was a, a society woman. She was an entertainer. She liked nothing better than having a big crowd of people around her. Uh, but if there's anything in the world mortified her, it was to have something go wrong at the table where she was serving. I'll never forget this day we had the family reunion and oh, we were all there and, and uh, Aunt Boo, of course, she didn't sit down. She stood up so that she, anything go wrong. And we were halfway through the meal when she suddenly remembered she forgot to put on the buttermilk. Well, she went down to the spring house where she keeps the buttermilk in a big jar and she's got a, a cloth over the top Happened to be a little hole in the cloth that day, and a little green frog fell in the buttermilk. Aunt Boo didn't see it, and she rushed up to the house, and in such a hurry, she poured the buttermilk out, and, and Grandpa Snazzy got the glass of buttermilk with a little frog in it. <laughs> well, uh, Aunt Boo was watching them, and everybody else had drank their buttermilk, but Grandpa Snazzy, he just sat there staring in this glass of buttermilk, didn't touch it. Aunt Boo says, what's the matter, Grandpa? You see something in your buttermilk? Grandpa says, yes, and he sees me, too. <laughs> now, now Miss Bankhead, long about here is where I plan for you to sing with me, if you're ready. Oh, thank you, Bob, darling. That's very sweet of you. <laughs> How come you do me like you do, do, do? Well, you'll never top that. Here's a word from RCA Victor. You know when spring puts in its appearance, the ladies always seem to catch the men off guard. They've been busy for weeks planning their spring wardrobe, studying the new styles, and this year there's one style everyone will want to study. It's the better-looking-in-every-way style of RCA Victor's magnificent new 17-inch television receiver, the Fairfield. With the Fairfield, you'll get television pictures which are exceptionally clear, bright, and steady. And you'll have RCA Victor's new picture pickup, which assures you of the best possible reception. If you've been looking for a television set that's going to look well in your home, here's your answer. The Fairfield's console cabinet is truly distinctive, and its beautiful doors close over the screen when your set's not in use. Go see your RCA Victor dealer. He'll be glad to show you the better-looking Fairfield. Well, 
Well, darlings, I don't know what all of you were doing back in the year 1910. Uh, those of you who were here at all, I mean. Uh, personally, back in 1910, my parents had not yet met each other. <laughs> and, uh, well, they didn't meet till about five years after that. And then they didn't get married till about two years after that. And then there was my sister who was born six years before I was. <laughs> and now, if you have any fingers left, darlings... You can figure out what I know you've been trying to figure. <laughs> Confused, darlings, well, uh, What I started to say was that back in 1910, there were a couple of wonderful comedians doing one of the great classics of show business. They had become partners in 1898, and they've been partners ever since. 53 years as a team in the theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Smith and Dale. We hear the never-to-be-forgotten Dr. Cronkite sketch. The scene at doctor's office, the patient Joe Smith, has just entered the office of Dr. Cronkite, Charlie Dale. Mr. Smith is greeted by the nurse, Miss Jean Courtney. How do you do, sir? Is this the office of Dr. Cronkite? Yes, I'm his nurse. His nurse? Mm -hmm. Is the doctor sick, too? Oh. No, no, I'm a trained nurse. Oh, you do tricks. <laughs> What's the doctor's office hours? His hours are from 12 to 3, 3 to 6, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, and 12 to 3. Well, he gives good odds. He must be a horse doctor. <laughs> no, those are his hours. Is that AM or FM? That's TV. TV? Oh, Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs> Is the doctor in now? Yes, but he's very busy. All right, I'll wait. Will you have a chair? Thank you. I'll take it on my way out. <laughs> How much does the doctor charge for a visit? Oh, he charges $5 for the first visit, yeah. $3 for the second, and one for the third. One dollar for the third visit? Yes. Thank you. Oh, here comes the doctor now. <laughs> this must be Hobby Lobby. <laughs> well, doctor, here I am again. Yeah, what? I never saw you before. I'm here life. for the fifth time. If I come here once more, you'll owe me eight cents. Yes, yes. So you're a doctor. I'm a doctor. I'm dubious. I'm pleased to meet you, Mr. Dubious. I'm awful glad to know you. I'm still dubious. Are you married, Mr. Dubious? Yes or no? What do you mean, yes or no? I am, but I wish I wasn't. Oh, sure. Have you got any children? I got three, a boy and a girl. Three, a boy and a girl. What's the other one? So young, who can tell? Do you carry any insurance? I ain't got one nickel insurance, Doc. Oh, if you should die, what would your wife bury you with? With pleasure. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> Seems to be your complaint. I don't know. Before I saw you, I saw another doctor. Uh -huh. He said I had snoo in my blood. What did I tell you? He told me I had snoo in my blood. Snoo? What snoo? Nothing. What snoo with you? Yeah. <laughs> What's the trouble here? What's happening? I don't know. I'm as sick as a dog. Don't worry. You came to the right place. I'm also a veterinarian. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's the matter? I don't know. Every time I eat a heavy meal, I don't feel so hungry after. Oh. That's my problem, oh, Doc. Oh, well, maybe, maybe you don't eat the right kind of dishes. <laughs> The white team in is, you don't eat that right. What kind of dishes do you eat? I should eat dishes. What kind of dishes? What am I, a crocodile? Yeah, what kind of... <laughs> What is your favorite dish? Aluminum. Yeah, no, no. I like aluminum with simis no, in it. No, no, no. You don't seem to grip me when I speak with you. I I'm... don't grip you. Yeah? If I don't grip you, don't grip no, me. No, you don't understand. Besides, you've been eating radishes. Yeah, radishes? What's the matter? Don't you like radishes? I love radishes, but not when you eat yeah, it. Yeah, Mr. Please. <laughs> Mr. Please, my time is liniment, please. All right, don't rub it in. Yeah, I don't rub you. I would like to know what kind of meats you eat. Will I eat? What? Will I eat? I don't ask you, will you? I says, what kind of meats you eat? What did I tell you? You ask me, will you? I don't want to know. I said, will you? I said, will I? Oh, for pity's sake, don't make me a cardinal. I don't know if that's Dr. Jekyll or Oscar Wilde. I ask you. I ask you. Wheel, wheel. We, he, hey, hell, wheel. Yeah, that's it. What do you think I eat? Wagon wheel. I eat wheel from a cutlet. You should say with the V and not with the V. You want eat wheel or wool? No, I don't know. Now, when you eat, how do you like your wheel? Medium? No, I like my wheel well to do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> One side, the other side optional. No, I would like to know when you drink drinks, what kind of drinking drinks do you drink? Have you drink sometime? Wait a minute, doctor, don't talk. Yeah. When you talk, you sing April Shower. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Please, I can't know what... You mean like coffee or milk or chocolate? That's right. I drink tea. tea. Now, what do you drink? What do you drink? Sea lion tea? No, orange Pekingese. Pekingese. <laughs> How much do you drink? 
much tea do you drink a day? About 12 glasses full. Oh, a lot of tea. It's a lot of tea. A lot of tea. I drink a lot of tea, yeah, too. Judge, huh? <laughs> uh, you drink tea with lemon? I can't go lemon. Oh, you're allergic. Allergic? You're allergic. I don't know how I'm going to vote next year. Yeah, but... <laughs> Ouch. What's the matter? I got a crick on my neck. What do you mean a crick? Doctor, I got rheumatism on the back of my neck. No. It's a bad place to have rheumatism on the back of my neck. No, where would you want a better place than on the back of your neck? On the back of your neck. Yeah, oh. <laughs> Go to Mount Clemens for your rheumatism. Is Mount Clemens a good place for rheumatism? Certainly. That's where I got mine. <laughs> that's so. Or you could go to Switzerland. Now, what can I do in Switzerland? Just sit there and switch. <laughs> <laughs> my chest hurts me. I got right. boysitis, everything. Right, I don't know what's the matter. Don't worry. I will examination you with the stethoscope. Don't Thank worry you. about that. Uh, take all the coat. Take all the coat, my boy. Take all the call to my boy. Take all, take all the call. The cold is all. What are you blowing on this stethoscope? I'm blowing. I'm sterilizing this. <laughs> Everybody gets a clean now. Yes, sir. Now, now, don't breathe. Please. Don't breathe. I gotta breathe, Doctor. I can't help it. Now I would like to see you inhale. Man, come to the doctor. Inhale, I would like to see you. Inhale, you would like to see me. Inhale. Inhale, I would like to see you. Now keep your mouth wide open and say fish. Hell okay. Now stick out the tongue. Yeah. Way out more. Way out more. I can't. It's tight on the back here. Okay. Oh, don't make me a child that's what you doctor to him. Please, I got no patience. You got no patience? Yeah. I shouldn't have been here yeah, either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See that the time. Uh, uh-huh. I've seen better tongues hanging in a butcher shop. I've seen better doctors practicing without All a right. diploma. All right. Put on the coat. Yes. Put on the coat, my boy. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for the concert, Doctor. Yeah. You understand the whole case? Yeah, the whole trouble of it you is you need eyeglasses. <laughs> I suppose if I had a headache, I would need an umbrella. No, no, you're right. Now, now you now. Well, what do I owe you? Ah, you owe me ten dollars for, for what? That's for my fee. Ten dollars for your fee. Ten dollars for my advice. Your advice. That's right. Well, Doctor, here is two dollars. Take it. That's my advice. <laughs> Why, you chisel, you cheapskate, you come in here, you cock a mini and waste me a half an hour of my time. One more word from you, you'll only get a dollar. Why? That's the word, here's a dollar. Uh, uh, And now, here is another real old team. My darlings being Crosby and Bob Hope. Bob, do you realize we only have one thing in common? Hardly enough for a happy marriage, is it? <laughs> What's that, Bing? Chesterfields, of course. We both like them, we both sell them. And we'd better get to selling them now. You know, folks, better tasting Chesterfield is the only cigarette that combines for you mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. How do you know they're mild? Well, you just make our mildness test. You buy them, open them up, and enjoy that milder aroma. Then smoke a Chesterfield. You'll know it's milder because it smokes milder. And Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That fact has been confirmed by the country's first and only cigarette taste panel. So, always buy Chesterfield. Let's sum it up musically. Chesterfield, Chesterfield always takes first place. That milder, mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. Oh, ho, open a pack and give them a smell. Then you'll smoke them. I'm having a wonderful time listening to these great acts of an earlier day in show business. Pardon me, Chalou? <laughs> yes, Jimmy, darling. Aren't you getting a kick out of these show business classics? I'm pretty classic myself. Of course, you may think I'm too young compared to these old timers, but I remember there used to be an act around Broadway called Clayton Jackson and some other fella. Durante. Uh, Anyway, they used to do a song, them three fellas, Clayton Jackson and that other fella. A Durante, darling. Who can pronounce them foreign names? <laughs> and now I'd like to do a song they used to do with the help of this young fella here with me. His name is Eddie Jackson. Uh, 
How do you do, Mr. Jackson? Howdy. Always glad to give a young team a helping hand. Mr. Durante and Mr. Jackson, the stage is yours. <laughs> Hello? Who is this? Isabel? Your man left you? Okay, I'll give me a message to the world for back. So stop your crying. Stop your sighing. I'll find that man and bring him back to you. Now won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Won't you come home? I'm on the whole day long. I'll do the cooking, darling. I'll pay the rent. I know I've done you wrong. Remember that rainy evening you drove me out With nothing but a fine tooth comb I know I'm the blame, now ain't it a shame Bill Bailey, won't you please come home And now folks, I want you to meet my partner Of Clayton Jackson and Durante, Mr. Eddie Jackson Won't you come home, Bill Bailey, won't you come home Sing it, hurry up, on the home Pay all that rent. Baby, I know I've done you wrong. Bailey, get back home. Oh, remember that old rainy evening, honey, you drove me out. Shame on you. With nothing but a pine to comb. You dog. Well, I know I'm the blame, baby. Ain't it a shame? Bill Bailey, won't you please come home? Let me hear that band. Remember that rainy evening You drove me out With nothing but a fine tooth comb Yeah, baby, I know I'm the blame Honey, ain't it a shame Bill Bailey, won't you please come home Now, Bill Bailey, where you hide? Where you been? Yeah, you've been away a long time, brother That's a sin Now, if someone only knew Just where you could be found We'd all go out and find you, make you come around. Hit Won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Won't you come home? Brother, I'm on the whole day long. Do the cooking, down. I'll pay the rent. Yes, and I know I've done you wrong. Eddie, if Bailey ain't on his way home by now, it's not our fault. Why, he might be home already. I hope so. Isabel wants to apologize. He says I'm to blame, darling. Bill Bailey, won't you please come home? We'll see you later. Bill Bailey, won't you please come The next time you suffer from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, take Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing anison tablets from their own dentist or physician, and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take anison for this wonderfully fast relief. Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N, anison comes in handy boxes of 12 and 30, economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Get anison. At any drug counter. Well, darlings, there's more to come. Not only another great classic comedian, Mr. Jack Pearl, but also coming back are Evelyn Knight, Billy Eckstein, Jimmy Durante, Celeste Holm, Meredith Wilson, and everybody else. But first, Ed Hurley, he wants to say... This portion of the program has been brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. 
And by Chesterfield, the cigarette that has for you what every smoker wants, mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste, the best cigarette for you to smoke. And by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And now to Lula, if you ring your chimes. Of course, Ed. This, darlings, is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is the big show, and Tallulah is about to introduce another great classic act of the theater. Some years ago, everybody walked around saying, Was you dare, Charlie? A catchphrase made famous by the great Baron Munchausen. In other words, Jack Pearl. Mr. Pearl with his famous sidekick, Charlie, Mr. Cliff Hawk. Well, well, Baron, I'm delighted to see you. Well, Charlie, of all the people <laughs> in the whole world. I haven't seen you in a long time. Where you been? I just come back from the design. Oh, you did? Yeah, I just come back. How'd you get over here? I came over on a shift. <laughs> see, I was... You came on a what? I came over on a shift. No, no, no. You, you mean a ship, a boat, a vessel. <laughs> One is enough. <laughs> I just was come it, over. Was it a fast ship? Oh, very fast. How fast was it? Oh, we was making over 60 miles an hour. No, 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 no. The, no, the Baron, ship you, was... you mean you were making 60 knots an hour? No, no. We was making 60 miles no, an no, hour. No, no, Baron. Nautically speaking, it's not. Now, I was on the boat, I tell you, miles. All right, Baron. Miles to you. All right. <laughs> Not still, all right. right. Oh. I don't want to have no argument how, with uh, you. How, how was the food aboard the ship, Baron? Food was just so-so. Oh, just so-so. You right. know something, Charlie? Mid every meal, I had to eat soup. With every meal, you had to eat I soup? I had to eat soup. Was it compulsory? You see, I was... Hello? <laughs> <laughs> I say, was it compulsory? No. <laughs> tomato soup. Oh, tomato. tomato. <laughs> no, they didn't have compulsory. Oh, oh say, by you the way, Baron, just, I... just a moment. Did you, did you know that Jimmy Durante has been looking all over this theater for you with a gun? What do you mean? He's looking for me with a revolver? <laughs> with a what? I say he's looking for me with a revolver. <laughs> With a revolver, yeah. Why, why he's looking for me, why? Well, he said that you called him a dirty name. I called him a dirty name? He said that you swore at him. Oh, what a liar! Yeah, what now, wait, listen, now, wait, wait, wait. Now, now, don't get excited. You'll get high blood pressure. No, not me. I'm anemic. Oh, no. sure. <laughs> no, listen, Charlie, I give you my solemn word. I never called him a dirty name, and I never swore well, at him. Well, then how did it happen? Here's how that comes out, just like it was. All right. Uh, what day is this today? Today? Yeah. Today is Sunday. Sunday. That was four days back. Mm -hmm. That was Wednesdays. Yeah. You see, I'm going out <laughs> with me, me, my... Wait a minute. What day did you say? Wednesdays. No. I no. was going... You mean Wednesday. Yeah, in the center of the week, like. No. You know <laughs> Wednesday, Wednesday, named after the god Woden. No. <laughs> Wednesdays is named after Tuesday. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> You see, Wednesdays, I was going in the country with my car. I see. Well, as, well, wait, as wait, I'm wait, driving... Wait a minute. Tell me, uh, what, what time of the day was this? Oh, this was maybe 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock a.m. or p.m.? Uh, so I'm going... I mean... <laughs> what was that? What? I say, was it, was it 9 o'clock a.m. or p.m.? <laughs> So I'm going out in my... <laughs> yes, I'm going to... Why don't you answer my question? Was it 9 o'clock a.m. or p.m.? No, no, no. That's not nice. What's not nice? Now, I don't like that. Now, you hear that? <laughs> now, what are you say... talking about? Now, I know what that is. Now, oh, don't oh, say that. You do. <laughs> so I'm going out All right, all right. Wait a minute. Now, I don't like You know it. what it is? Yeah. Well, what is it? About the farmer's daughter. No. I don't like <laughs> Just a minute. Now, will you calm yourself? Look. Yeah. I'll make this a little more clear to you. Yeah? Was it nine o'clock before noon or afternoon? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So we're going out. That's good. That's good. That's we going Look, out. will you please tell me the time of the day you were driving in the country? Nine o'clock. <laughs> nine o'clock a.m. or p.m.? No, A-Z that was. A-Z? A-Z. What do you mean, A-Z? After supper. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> nine o'clock, nine o'clock after supper, yeah. we, we was going in the country. We? We was. Who's we? My sweetheart and myself. What, you keeping company with a girl? What do you think, me the horse? Well, I don't know. Me the girl. With a girl, huh? Oh, she's some cat. Nice girl? I'm, I'm, I'm... 
Crazy over that one. <laughs> so well, tell she, me, Brian, she, is, is your girl blonde, brunette, or Tisha? Yeah, so we going... To... Is she what? I say, is your girl blonde, brunette, or Tisha? No, go ahead. <laughs> she's a Polak. She's no. a Polak. <laughs> you don't know who she is. You don't know. You mean, you mean she... You don't know who she is. She's of Polish extraction. No, no, Polish people. Well, that's the same. <laughs> yeah, her mother and father is Polish. Yeah, well, is, so she, we, uh, is she Czechoslav or Jugoslav? So we're going for... I beg your stuff. <laughs> I say, is she Czechoslav or Yugoslav? <laughs> Good natured Slav. Oh. <laughs> you don't know who she is. Come here. You don't know. He don't know. So listen, so we was so we oh Charlie. What? I want to ask you one thing. Right ahead. Uh, uh, did you ever was in love? Oh, I've been in love yet. Yeah, uh, you, you know, uh, 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 well, you know how love is. Yes, of course. We <laughs> we was going in the woods. Oh, you I see, see you were. Uh, you went in the woods to cogitate. Yeah. So when we... <laughs> I went for what? What am I meant? I say, you went in the woods to cogitate. Oh. <laughs> we'll come to that later. Oh. <laughs> so we go in this... Oh, so, Baron, now wait a so minute. Look, go... that is the dumbest thing I think I've ever heard you say in my life. Now, why you say this, I'm dumb? Well, because I think you're Now, dumb. I'm just so smart as you. Now, what do you think of that? There, there's that no is... time to argue, please. Listen, you know, I was never in school so long I lived. Oh, you were never in school. Do you know that when, you know that when I was seven years old, I was working, supporting my mother and my father? When you were seven years old, yeah. you were work... Where were you working? And in the old country. You were yes. working in the old country when yeah. you were seven years... Well, I, I was the support of my mother and my father. Well, whereabouts in the old country were you working at seven? In, in Holland, where I was born. All right, but <laughs> what part of... Wh whereabouts in Holland were you working? What farm. sort of work were you doing? And I was working on a farm. You were working on a when farm? When I was seven years old. What sort of work were you doing on the farm? Uh, what do you call that here in America? I was a pilot. Uh, when I was seven, I was... You were a what? Pilot. You were so, a pilot on a farm? Yeah, when I was seven well, years... what are the duties of a pilot on a farm? <laughs> My boss used to say, pilot, here. Yeah, all right, wait a minute. <laughs> seven years old. Yes, yes, yes. Now, that proof, it yeah. does not prove you. You know done. something else? What? I tell you what I do, Mickey. What? I bet you five dollars. Oh, you, you see, so smart you are, so dumb I am. Yes. I could answer my question where you could not answer yours. Now, wait a minute. Let me understand you. You want to bet me five dollars you can answer your question where I can't answer Yeah, mine. I bet you five dollars. All right, the bet is on. All right. Have you got five dollars with you? Yes, I think so. Uh, if you win, you trust me, yes, huh? Sure. Hey, <laughs> let me see. Did you, uh, did you ever was in the woods? You know what? I say, did you ever was in the woods? Did I ever was in the woods? Yeah. Your grammar is bad. Yeah, she's an old lady yes, now. Sure. Listen, <laughs> did you ever was in yes, the woods? Yes, I've been in the woods. When you was in the woods, did you ever see holes? Did I ever see what? I schlepp no, 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 no. Did you ever see holes? What are you talking about? Holes. Oh, hole. How you see it? Hole. Hole eyes. Oh. Did you ever see hole eyes? <laughs> well, what kind of hole? Rabbit. <laughs> what kind? Rabbit, rabbit holes. Rabbit holes? Yeah. Yes, I've seen rabbit holes. Also, wait. Do you know, understand this, yeah. do you know how the rabbit makes that hole without leaving any dirt around it? Do I know how the rabbit makes the hole without leaving any dirt around Yeah, do you know that? Well, now, that's a very difficult question, and I must admit I can't answer it. Can you? Could I? Yeah. That is my question, and I must answer it. That's right. It. They start from the bottom, and they dig up. And I never was in school. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I have you now. How does the rabbit get to the bottom in order to dig to the top? <laughs> That's your question. You answer it. <laughs> The presence of such show business immortals as our guest tonight on the big show and the fact that this month marks the 13th anniversary of his passing reminds us that there is another great name that deserves to take his place in that company, the Boswell of the 30s, the affectionate and understanding historian of our turbulent youth, the late O. McIntyre. I feel that a close friend is better qualified than an ardent admirer to pay tribute to Art McIntyre. And so, darlings, I'd like to call upon Meredith Wilson.
Yes, Tallulah, I was a friend of Odd's and an admirer of his, too. But people like me can be counted in the millions across this country because every reader of McIntyre's was both a friend and an admirer. And I'll bet if we listen real close, we can hear the rustle of those aging clippings still kept on a shelf, still read of an evening at home. Yes, Meredith. Odds was the quiet, small voice of the hometown boy lost in the wonders of the big city. And our best tribute to Odd McIntyre would be to let that voice speak again in words and music. The music is from Meredith Wilson's symphonic composition, the O.O. McIntyre Suite, written before Odd's death. And Meredith and his orchestra will play the movement called Thoughts While Strolling, and I will read the words from one of Odd's most famous columns, still read and cherished over all America. First the music, Thoughts While Strolling. <laughs> Hear now the words of Art McIntyre as he spoke to us. Gave us his thoughts while strolling from one of his most famous columns. Fifth Avenue, street of dreams and enchantment, street of tragedy, personal tragedy. For here is where I lost my dearest friend, my dog. Brothers and sisters, I bid you beware of giving your hearts to a dog to tear. Eight of the happiest years of my life were spent in the almost constant companionship of a devoted dog. When he was taken from me, I grieved inconsolably. For weeks, I walked the streets at night, trying to get hold of myself. My dog's name was Junior. He was a Boston bulldog weighing 24 pounds. He was full of joyous life, and never outgrew his prankishness. I picked him up in a Fifth Avenue dog shop in much the same manner that one buys a trinket. I thought he was cute looking. He was four weeks old, and he trotted sideways with mock seriousness. I took him home in my overcoat pocket. From that day on, for eight years, he played a big part in my life. He came to understand me better than most of my human associates. He knew his time for play and my time for work. He did not trespass. For six years, he never varied five minutes. At the stroke of five o'clock in the evening, and coming to me with his rubber ball in his mouth, that was his hour for romp. He demanded his hour. One of my great faults has always been a lack of punctuality, but I was always on the dot to keep the romping appointment with Junior. One day, I got to thinking about this, and the result was that I became more careful. Surely, 
I should show humans as much consideration as I showed my dog. For several years, Junior and his mistress and I used to walk around the gravel path of the Central Park Reservoir in New York at dusk after his romp. At such times, I would permit him to frolic and roll in the grass, unleashed and unmuscled. One evening, however, he disappeared in a clump of bushes and refused to come out at my call and whistled. I followed him and found him squatting beside a stray dog that had been injured by a passing automobile. We called the bider we home and the hurt creature was taken to it and cured. This incident gave me some serious moments of introspection. How often, I asked myself, had I stopped along the roadside to comfort the stricken and forlorn? We did not continue the walk home just then. Instead, we left Millionaire's Row, wandered over to the squalid section of New York's east side, and mounted the rickety stairs of a crowded tenement. There we sat at the bedside of an old copper who had lived in our neighborhood, who had been stricken with a fatal illness. We paid his small rent, had some food sent to him, and were occasional visitors until the end. I do not do so much of this sort of thing as I should, but the credit for what little I have done is due to Junior. Here is one incident which I hesitate to tell. More than likely, it is the merest coincidence, but it is set down here just as it happened. Junior accompanied me one summer to my little hometown in Missouri, and together we went one afternoon to the cemetery to visit the grave of my mother. It had been a number of years since I'd been there, and the place had become so strange to me that I, I wandered around for half an hour in an effort to find the grave. Finally, I gave it up as hopeless. Looking around for Junior, I saw him lying down about 100 yards away. He didn't seem inclined to come to me, so I went to him, and I found that he was resting at the side of my mother's grave. I come to the final chapter of Junior's life with tears that are shed unashamed. Junior, like all good dogs, was faithful to the end. He died obeying my command, which made his loss all the more tragic to me. It was late at night, little traffic on Fifth Avenue. I took off his leash. He had been trained to wait at the curb until he received the command, go. Then he would race across like a flash. I stepped to the curb and looked for traffic. There seemed to be none. I shouted, go. Junior was off at a bound. At that instant, a party of reckless joyriders swung madly around the corner, and Junior was hit. He staggered to his feet, and as I lifted him in my arms, he looked up with his soft, pleading eyes, begging for the help. I could not give. Hailing a taxi cab, I hurried to my hotel a few blocks away. But before I'd reached there, he died, without even a whimper of pain. He lies buried today in the picturesque dog cemetery on the sloping hills near New York. Yes, it's true what Kipling wrote. Brothers and sisters... I bid you beware of giving your hearts to a dog to tear. the great classics of show business, popular music, too, has survived the march of years. We have picked a medley of songs which were great in their time 
and which today are enjoying huge success as revivals. Meredith Wilson, his big show orchestra and chorus, assisted by Evelyn Knight, Billy Eckstein, and Celeste Holm, will present that medley. Meredith, darling, if you please. <laughs> Dabba 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 dab said the chimpy to the monkey. Dabba 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 dab said the monkey to the chimp. All night long they'd chatter away. All day long they were happy and gay, swinging and singing in the honky tonky way. Dabba 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 means monkey, I love but you. Baba da ba da bin monkey talk means chimp, I love you too. Then the big baboon one night in June, he married them in Pakistan. They went upon their Abba da ba honeymoon. Here. Told a lie. If I made you cry when I said goodbye, I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart. I apologize. Cause you pain, I know I'm to blame. Must have been insane. Believe me, from the bottom of my heart, I apologize. I I've been unfair to you Please let me make amends Don't say that you forgot the love we knew After all Give me back romance Give me one more chance Forgive me From the bottom of my heart dear, I Lullaby of Broadway, the hip hooray, the ballyhoo, that's the lullaby of Broadway, the rumble of the subway train, the rattle of the taxi, the daffy deals who entertain, at Angelo's and Maxie's, when a Broadway baby says goodnight, it's early in the morning. Manhattan babies don't sleep tight Until the dawn, the dawn, the dawn, the dawn, the dawn So good night, baby It's 5 a.m. We'll soon be born We've been to all the bistros, crawled in every pub, to 
like you've really gotten around. We've been to parties, Armando's, the Versailles and the Stork, the Cody, the Copa, the Airs in 21, the Morocco, the Angel, the Plaza, Rue and Blue, the Astor and the Water. We've really had fun, now let's go home. See, darlings, that's what I mean. Everybody sings on our show with me. Especially after that wonderful article in this month's radio and television mirror that says I'm a great singer. I wrote it myself. <laughs> During a medley of Broadway's hits, and they leave out the biggest one of all, the song I do so well, give my regards to Broadway. It's a conspiracy. You're right, Chalu. It's like Abercrombie without fish shampoo. <laughs> It's like Montgomery without Cliff. <laughs> Jimmy, darling, I'm so glad you feel that way. And so just for you, I'm going to sing Give My Regards to Broadway. Okay, Tallu, I'll give me your regards. So long. <laughs> remember me to Herald Square. Leave it to Evelyn. I'll remember you to the Herald and all the squares. Good night. <laughs> Tell all the boys on 42nd Street that I will soon be there. I just happen to be going over towards 42nd Street to Lula. I'll tell him. Good night. Tell them as I'm yearning. Say, tell me, Baron, did you ever hear singing like that? Charlie, for the first time in my life, the Baron cannot tell a lie. <laughs> I never heard anything like it. <laughs> Good night, Lula. Good night, Lula. Mingo with the old time song. Well, I guess I better be going, Miss Bankhead. That sounds like hog feet in time to me. <laughs> Give my regards to old Broadway. Well, who should know better how old Broadway is? Good night. <laughs> and say that I'll be there long. Put on the coat, my boy. <laughs> and le let's go. Come on. Our coats are on. Cowards. Well, darlings, that's our show for this week. Next Sunday, we have another cast of the big names of show business. Fred Allen, Phil Baker, Eddie Cantor, Eddie Fisher, Ella Fitzgerald, Portland Hoffer, Jan Pierce, and others. And, of course, our very own Meredith Wilson and the big show orchestra and chorus. And until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you. Whether near or far away, Evelyn. May you find that long-awaited golden day to 
today. Jack? May your troubles all be small ones and your fortune ten times ten. Smith and Dale. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Bob? May we walk with sunlight shining and a bluebird in every tree. Celeste? May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see. Meredith? Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows. Never mind what might have been. Jimmy? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Billy? May you long recall each rainbow then you soon forget the rain May the warm and tender memories be the ones that will Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet till we meet Good night, darlings, and God speed to our armed forces all over the world who hear these broadcasts each week. The Big Show is produced and directed by D. Engelbach. And written by Goodman Ace, Selma Diamond, George Foster, Mort Green, and Frank Wilson. This is Ed Hurley, he's speaking. <laughs> Laugh with Phil Harris and Alice Faye. And remember, the Hasty Heart on Theater Guild on NBC.